Good morning. After that high octane debate, I think we'll get down to some uh, serious business and we'll get down to anatomy and science behind the mid-phase rejuvenation. Uh, when we talk about the mid-phase rejuvenation in fillers, that has become the baseline to start your practice in. So people who are injecting or who, do, who are doing fillers, this is one area that you have to start with. So if you intend to start practicing fillers, please know how to do your mid-phase rejuvenation. So let's look at the basic uh, anatomy and the basic concept. But before that, I want to show you this photograph of a patient who came to me, and this is the picture that I clicked in the, in the clinic, and this is what she sent me a month later. She was quite happy. What we did was we did the mid-phase rejuvenation with fillers. Obviously, there are other things that have been done to her in the sense that the upper face was done with Botox. We had the masseters which were done. Some fillers were put in the lips as well, and a little bit of jawline correction was done. But the base is to do the mid-phase to really give the patient a great response. You have to understand that the aging of a mid-phase typically starts in the 30s. The lower eyelids and the surrounding areas are the first to really cause the concern. And almost all aspects of the mid-phase undergo degeneration one by one. So there is a bone remodeling happening, there is tissue loss and there is subcutaneous loss. So when you have a patient, say, who's 65 or 70 years old, you've got to think about the bone loss, you've got to think about the skin changes, you've got to think about the volume loss. All three have to be looked at. And the mid-face is, is losing its uniformly rounded fullness and it forms a more square or Y shape. Now, what happens? There are a lot of these changes which are happening as a patient is aging. There'll be a wider orbital aperture. There's a reduced anterior projection and there's a reduced overall projection and convexity of the cheek and there's a reduced support for the overlying structures. So these are the things that the patient comes to us. But why is it happening? Because there is the descent of the malar fat pad. So your aging is happening in the fat pad compartments. It is also happening in the ligaments which are holding these compartments together. So this is where your aging happens, the descent of the malar fat pad. It leads to infraorbital hollowing, and there's the deepening of the nasolabial and the nasogeagal folds. So loss and ptosis is happening, as I mentioned, in the fat compartment. It's also happening in the SOOF. SOOF is the suborbicularis ocular fat pad compartment, and it results in a double convexity. So a lot of times you'll see patients come, come and complain to you about the picture that you see in the bottom right. They say they, they see this double convexity and they're not happy with it. So they're basically a lot of uh, fat loss in the SOOF area, which is resulting in this kind of a deformity. But most of our patients, if you realize, they come to us with the nasolabial folds. But the nasolabial folds are happening because there is loss of volume up here in the cheeks. So when the cheek volume loss is happening, this is when they get the nasolabial folds. So patient comes to you and says the laugh lines are a problem. It is actually in the cheeks that the problem lies. So look at the cheeks as doctors, we got to rectify that. But as I mentioned, the bone is important and a lot of these bone structures are different. If you look at a patients in Indian patients, the patients coming in from Northeast India, the patients coming in from Nepal, they have a wider zygomatic bone. So they need to be treated a little differently. You need to kind of take up the cheeks differently. But very important, as I mentioned, is the, uh, the different things that are happening inside the skin as well. So there's muscle activity which you should be aware of. And then you should also look at the ligaments. Now what are the ligaments important for us? These, the ones in blue, are the important ligaments because these are the ones that are holding the fat pad compartments there. So the zygomatic cutaneous ligaments, the platysmal auricular, the mesetric and the mandibular ligaments are the main ligaments that are holding to together your fat pad compartments. And these are the major fat compartments that are important for us when you're doing the cheek augmentation. You have to look at the middle cheek, the medial cheek, and the lateral temporal cheek fat compartments. These are the compartments that you put your filler in so that the patient gets an adequate lift, as they call it, when the patient comes to you. But for all beginners, for all people who are injecting, this is the most important slide. This talks about the arterial supply. And this is where people can go wrong, as they were talking in the debate, managing the complications. Yes, we should know the complications, we should know how to manage the complications. So these are the vessels that you have to be wary of, especially the infraorbital artery and the angular artery. And especially when you're using a needle, when you go in, you inject into the vessel, it can travel into the eye and cause blindness. And there are more and more cases of blindness which are coming into the picture now. 
Another very important picture is of the superficial temporal artery. Rajat mentioned about the anterior branch. This happens when you're doing the temples along with the cheeks. So the superficial temporal artery is very important when you're treating the temples as well. So when you look at this lady, when she comes to me, if I, I was there 10 years back, I would jump onto the nasolabial folds, but now my concentration is into the mid-face compartment. Even younger patients, if you look at this before and after picture of a young patient, she has lost that malar fat pad and that is what we filled in the after picture. A male patient, males have to be treated a little differently, but in this particular case, this male patient just came for some filler into the cheeks. He looks good, but he looks a little feminine, so you need to treat your male patients in the cheeks a little different. So what do you do? How do you treat your patients when they come for the cheeks? Especially your male patients, you have to try and concentrate on the middle uh, thing that I've made there. That is the area to concentrate. And then you treat the tear trough and the nasolabial area and probably do a little bit in the jawline. So this is how a male patient is different from a female patient. And this is how he looks before and after treatment. This is with fillers into the cheeks and the tear trough and the, temp and the nasolabial folds. So in India, we've realized a lot of our patients have this festooning or the mounding as we call it, which is there in that circle that is not marked out. If you see that circle, that is the portion that we should not be doing in such patients. Patients who complain of swelling in that mound area when they get up in the morning, you have to avoid those patients. You try and inject in the three-fourths of the semicircle and probably in the tear trough area as well. Very important is to have these uh, lines or markings. If you know how to mark your patients, if you know how to demonstrate to the patients what area you're treating, you'll have a better patient compliance and the patient keeps on coming back because they understand that you know their face better. So mark your lines. These are hindrance lines that have been marked to show how to inject fillers. This is again the marking that needs to be done in the patients to get to the right aspect. Sometimes you need to combine treatments. Even the mid-face when you're doing it, you might want to combine threads with fillers to get the required amount of improvement. This is a patient where we've only done the anteromedial cheek, zygomatical eminence, the zygomatic arch, and the tear trough injection with one ml. This is immediately before and after, so there's a subtle change that you can appreciate, not a huge change. Remember, when you put fillers, you have to give them time, up to 15 days, so that they can absorb water and pull up the face. This is a patient immediately before and after, wherein the injection has been done in the anteromedial cheek, and the tear trough, one ml, has been injected to give her a subtle improvement. This is a male patient after the cheeks and the tear trough with 3 ml. Again, a subtle change, but the change keeps on improving in the next 15 to 30 days. This is a patient wherein, again, zygomatic eminence, the anteromedial cheek and the tear trough has been injected before and after. And this is just to demonstrate that the right side has been done, the right tear trough has been done, and the left cheek has been done. So if you notice carefully a very important slide, it's better to do the cheek first. If you only do the tear trough, she looks sad, but if you do the cheek as I've done on the left side, it gives you a better pull and you need red, less material in the tear troughs. So we've done one side only the cheek, one side we've done only the tear trough without the cheek just to demonstrate how much is the improvement that you can get if you just inject the cheek with the fillers. Review of literature, if you look at, there are a lot of these uh, different algorithms and tre uh, treatment techniques. But you have to devise your own techniques. There was this eight-point lift that you were following earlier. And then there's this uh, by Dr. Swift, which you are following later. And then we've moved on to cannula as well. A cannula is a good technique, though Rajat would not agree to it. I don't know if he's around. But we've, we've had these fights over whether we should use a needle or a cannula. I find the cannula a wonderful thing to get into the cheeks, especially when I have to go deep down to the deep subcutaneous plane and give the patient some volume in that area. It is difficult when you start your practice, but as you get accustomed to it, this is probably the most wonderful tool in your practice of fillers. This is a patient before and after with the cannula. This is again a patient before and after. This is with the cannula. This is a patient where an over-volumization has been done, so you have to be careful. Don't put too much fillers into chubby faces. And Dr. Maya Vedmurti has actually published this wherein she talks about how it is basically 99% technique. So fillers are a piece of art. You have to really know how to work around with fillers. And this is a patient before and after, a young patient, just to demonstrate that working in that mid-phase can change a patient's perspective completely. Last, this is the new thing that we are doing now, the five-point re, uh, cheek reshape. So these are the five points that we use. CK1 is zygomatic arch. CK2 is zygomatic eminence. 
CK3 is the anteromedial cheek, CK4 is the uh, parotid area, and CK5 is the submalar area. So knowing these points for beginners is very good. You can start your practice and start injecting, and you get a good, decent response. Remember, when you're injecting fillers, if you're using a needle, you have to be on the bone. If you're using a cannula, you can be in the subcutaneous plane to avoid vascular complications. And these are the different techniques, or rather the injection points that I was showing earlier. You can use a needle and go down on the bone and inject. This is a patient before and after. This is with 6 ml that has been done. And this is another patient before and after. The purpose of doing the mid face is to make the patient from a sad to a really happy looking face. That's the thing that we're trying to do. And conclusion, this is the starting point of the facial rejuvenation. Inject on the bone with a needle or use a cannula. Give the patient a natural look. You have to think global, but look at the Indian differences that you can point out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, may I call upon any questions? I think we can take it up later on. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Dr. Amit, I just wanted to ask if you want to you do a tear trough along with the anteromedial cheek, which filler will you use? What okay. will be the choice? Okay, if the concern for the patient is the tear trough, you'll obviously decide on the basis of the tear trough. So a good probably filler would be, if I have to name a filler, it would be a Juvedum Volift that I'll use or probably a Juvedum uh, Ultra Plus because I'll want to probably pull the cheeks up as well and deep down I'll put it on the, on the bone in the tear trough. So Volift is a good choice. If, if, you, if I have a young patient who does not have issues of cheek augmentation, I'll go with a lighter filler like a Volbella, a Juvedum Volbella to fill up the tear trough. Yeah, thank you sir.